Hello. So, this is going to be slightly different from the live, and I'm re-recording this technically at 11, 2300 hours, roughly, on the 10th of March. So, hey-ho, but I've got a interesting day tomorrow, and I thought I'd re-record it because I didn't like the one I'd done already. The one I'd done already was recorded pre-to-live. During the live, I talked the whole way through the Battle of Jutland and went through my notes that way. That would have made this very long, but also it wouldn't have got into the things which I want to get into. So if you would like to have the talk the whole way through, that's part of the live. I know some people do not enjoy the lives because I respond to the chat, and therefore occasionally I divert off to answer questions, etc., which sometimes are not always... 100% within the direct topic, but that's how it's going to be, because this is a very large subject to get into. I also, therefore, because there are people who are going to watch the first five minutes who are just looking, what happened, what would happen? Well, basically, I changed the question from Green Boys to what if they had proper quality control over shells? which there are several divergent points of history where they could have gained proper quality control and proper trials and testing of shells. Because the trouble is, the trials and testing of shells basically had reached the standard in about 1902, 1903, and hadn't, didn't really change, despite armour, despite the guns changing, till, in British service, 1917. And if you think about the sheer ginormous amount of technological, metallurgical, and just plain old actual difference in warships, in the frigating things you're dealing with, not changing is absolutely absurd. But it makes sense in a time. There is a logic. And the logic comes from the arms manufacturers. So there is that. That is a factor. Because if you change the testing, then the shells you're producing might not turn out to be as good. They might not turn out to be as successful as you want them to be. They might actually fail. Whereas if you leave the testing the same you know you'll pass. It's like all testing. If you leave testing the same, you can guarantee that people will pass it. If you change the testing, it doesn't. So, that comes up with then the phrase of green boy or green boy-ish shells. Because, do you develop stuff which is exactly the same? Because Lidite has seen perfect... You know, it's the most powerful explosive they can get. To actually temper Lidite you ha and make it more controllable and make the explosions less likely to happen prematurely, you have to add something to it. A less powerful explosion, explosive. You have to, for want of a better phrase, water it down. Which seems in completely counterintuitive. And if you think about the salesman trying to sell that in peacetime... There's a problem to that. Yes, sir, to make this shell work better, we have to make it less powerful than it theoretically could be. Now, you're listening to that and you're going, well, that probably makes sense, because probably you're navally inclined, you're interested in military history, and probably that makes sense, because you're thinking, well, the explosion of power... What happens, is, what matters is being able to control that explosion. Being able to sure it goes off when I want it to go off, not before. Not having the most explosive power possible. But you're not the people who are in charge of procurement in this period. You're not the politicians, you're not the press. We're talking about people who have produced articles which, talk, which can, uh, when they read five inch gun, thinks that means it's five inches long, not five inches in calibre. They think the whole gun is five inches long. 
And they've published serious articles like that. And there are countless more articles I can point to. Countless more strange things in history and things I can point to. And that make the people who are informed have to roll their eyes and go, Oh, good lord. But that's not because those people are bad people. Please note, it's not that they're bad people. And even in this period, when you have really well-informed press, when you have the people who produce... Let's grab them. Why is a Brassies never available when I'm looking for it when I've been reading it five minutes ago? There it is. There's a Brassies. And there's actually two Brassies behind me, aren't there? They're both Brassies. And then there's the blue ones up there, which are the original bindings. So, now I spot them. After I grab one, I spot it. This is Brassies from 1912. You have actual naval annuals produced yearly, which have full, full contents of information. Huge amounts of information on them. Actually available. And still, and still, you get the bloopers. Possibly not as bad as you get today, because let's be honest, half the problem for modern journalism is the time they have to produce it. You see, someone like me, who is producing a video to my own schedule, can record four of them. It's absolutely a chronic waste of my time if you look at it from an economic perspective, because I'm only publishing one, and the I don't have, I don't even have ten thousand subscribers. So, I'm in the earning the pot of money from YouTube, but I don't get, I get the most basic rate you can imagine from YouTube, and that's fine. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I do this because my own desire for perfectionism and the fact is I'm my own boss. So I can do that. But if you're a journalist writing for a newspaper or on, 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 publishing online, the important thing is publishing first. You are trying to get it as correct as you can when you're quickly reading it, within, let's say you've got 30 minutes to turn it around and produce the copy, which then goes to an editor and might go to a fact checker who might all themselves have 30 minutes and you're producing an article which covers a topic which none of you have in-depth personal knowledge of in 90 minutes. It's not like taking the time to write a book. And even that can have copy errors in it and things where editors have changed things or you've put spelling mistakes in and no one's noticed it and it's gone through and you, you don't know how it's gone through because it's been literally read by a dozen people and you about a bazillion times before it's been published and it's still got those little mistakes in it and you're going, how? So here is the reality. Okay. In historically, Lutzow is sunk. And yes, it sinks on the 1st of June rather than the 31st of May. And yes, it is sunk by a German torpedo because it's not getting home. But let's be honest, that's due to battle damage. My view is if the. Royal Navy had implemented a program, and I'm going to suggest when I think it would have been implemented, and I have reasons for explaining that. I think the new shells would have come in after Dogger Bank, but before the uh, before Jutland, and I think therefore, I it doesn't have any effect on what the Germans are going to do because both sides are introducing new shells, and as far as the Germans are concerned, the Germans presuming and basing their calculation on the British shells being the same quality as their shells. That's the thing. The Germans are presuming the British shells are the same as their shells, which actually overestimates the British shells by several factors of capability. One of the things the British learn through their intelligence after the Battle of Jutland is how surprised the Germans were at how ineffective our shells were compared to their own in capabilities. But... Do you think if the shells had all been had all exploded rather than just some of them had pierced the armor and not gone off, some of them pierced the armor and 
fragmented before going exploding, so the explosive material loses containment and loses its scenario, loses its ability to actually do a big bang. Because if you think about it, if you think about an ex a gunpowder, etc., when we're, when you're firing a musket, everything's in a controlled chamber. Why? Because it's the expansion of the gases from that gunpowder being ignited which give the force to the ball to go out the, uh, the musket. The same in a cannon. It's the same with a shell explosion. It's the explosion, first of all, in contained space, which adds fury to that explosion. Best way to describe it, non-scientifically and non-engineeringly, but the best way to describe it is that containment provides fury to the explosion as it gets set off by the fusing, and then it expands even more. And it's that expansion of gas and heat and fury that causes the damage. It's all the pressure it creates. Now, imagine if you've lost the containment because your shell has fragmented. And therefore, your lovely lidite has gone all over the place. It's now spread a little bit all over the place. What happens? And it goes boom. Well, A, not all of it goes boom at the same time. Sugar. Sort of fizzles. And B, it has a lot less power. Instead of it being a reaction, it's a... And some of them, the lidite goes off literally as they hit the outer hull. So instead of the shell piercing the hull and going off, it hits the hull, boom, instantly. Which is the perfect thing for the armour. By the way, if you hit it a second time in the same place, that would then cause problems for the armour. But it, in the first time, it's the perfect thing for the armour. It weakens it. If you get between joints, you can cause damage. But honestly, the odds are, with the shells that we're hitting, and especially from the Queen Elizabeth class of 5th Battle Squadron that hit Sadlitz and hit the Flinger and hit Lutzal. The ones which worked and hit, uh, hit Lutzal, the reason Lutzal doesn't get home. So I think it's safe to say that in a scenario in Jutland where the British have proper fire, uh, have the same fire control, have the same quality gunners they have, have all everything else the same. The only thing is they have quality, they have quality control and better testing, and therefore development trials and testing of their shells. So they have good, bo uh, they have Green Boy or Green Boy equivalent esque shells, equivalently in sort of their testing and uh, manufacture then I think it's safe to say that Durflinger, Sadlitz, and Lutzel, all three, do not break, make it home. In which case, I don't think, myself, with Hipper dead, Shear is going to carry on, and I think Shear turns for home. Probably without ever the fleets getting in contact. I think Shear turns for home on the run north, because the run south, that's where the British lose a couple of battle cruisers, and it's really not long before the run north that the fifth battle squadron do join, and then and they start firing backwards. And I think it's as fifth battle squadron are involved in the fight, that would take out the most of the Germans. But there is a potential actually that the Germans lose ships before that point, because again, you have to remember the shells will affect not uh, will uh, will they're affected will not just be the shells which are fired by the 15-inch ships, they'll be the 13.5-inch ships and the 12-inch ships will all get their shells upgraded by better shell profiling testing. And if there's any doubt, I am fairly certain that the ships which would most likely... If they, and I've given, in my hypothesis, at least an 18-month gap for it to happen when you consider in reality it took roughly 12 months. For them to start, uh, for them to have delivered them to the fleet in enough that the fleet are all get uh, uh, all have them. But in that was under wartime conditions, and that was 1917 to 1918, basically. But 
under this scenario, uh, you know, the the minimum two groups you would have had got uh, would have got these uh, would have got new shells would have been the battle cruiser fl force and fifth battle squadron. And why? Because fifth battle squadron are the ace in the hole for the entire British Grand Fleet, and the battle cruiser force because if you consider Dog and Bank and all the other ones, they're the ones most likely to end up in battle. They're the ones most likely to end up in combat. So those are the two forces that are going to get priority on getting the sh new shells. I, therefore, do not think it's very likely that Ju I think Jutland becomes another version like Dogger Bank, but this time 5th Battle Squadron gets involved. And I think the Germans lose some battle cruisers and go for home. Because they don't want to lose ships. They want to make the British lose ships. And if they lose enough ships, they're going to head for home. Because, again, if you're chasing north after them and you're losing ships, where are they running to? In the nicest way, where are they running to? And if you're sheer and you're losing ships and you no longer have Hipper, you no longer have three of your battle cruisers, three of five battle cruisers are gone, the British have lost two battle cruisers, maybe? You are not going to carry on you're going to turn around and go back. Because losing capital ships at that rate is not something you're in a good for, a good mood for. Especially when there isn't much chance of you actually catching those squadrons, and the longer you chase them, the more likely it is the Grand Fleet turns up. You might not know where the Grand Fleet is, but the moment there are battleships there, there's 5th Battle Squadron there, that's going to make you start thinking, hang on, there could be, there are, there's a squadron of battleships already here. Where are the others? Now, when you haven't lost anything and you're still fighting and everything's running high, then you carry on. You go, yeah, we can catch them, we can take them out, and we can cure them. But it's very different psychology when you've started losing ships. It's a very different scenario. So my view is the Battle of Jutland would not take place as it happened. My view is the Battle of Jutland would be another Donga Bank. And you could end up with either BT being lionized or BT being <clears throat> you had your, the, the the navy looking at the reports and going so your um bacon eggs were pulled out of the fire by uh, Evan Thomas All right then you will get no longer get any more seagoing commands after this one in which case he loses any chance of ever becoming first sea lord and ground fleet commander um, of course, Jellico doesn't get to pull off his team and his uh, his team maneuvers and show how great a commander he is as well. So there's that, but we don't lose a third battle cruiser. So what is the big difference between the Green Boy shell and the Briti and the shells before it? Well. There's the quality control. There's the fact the shell itself has been breaking up, the fuse has been bad, all those things. But the big difference, the really big difference, and you can say the big scientific difference, because all the rest was quite easy, very easy to fix. Very, very disturbingly easy to fix, okay? It was horrendously easy to fix, if you consider the time it took. The difference between a Green Boy shell and the... And the previous shells. Did I call? I hope I've called them Green Boys the whole time. Hmm. I know. Anyway, the difference between them is shellite and pure versus poor lidite. Shellite is lidite and dinotrophenol mixed. Now, dinotrophenol is Still not a very nice explosive. It is. Trust me, if you got hit by a shell with dinotrophenol, you would not be happier. It's not a case of, oh good, we got hit by the slightly less powerful explosive. It would be a case of, that wasn't fun. You'd still probably not be alive. So it is a kind of case of mixing... Uh, how do I put this politely? Lidite is unstable, uh, is... Um, Okay, let's say you have two friends. 
One is the type that when there's trouble or an argument, goes off very quickly and likes to thump people. The other one, when there's an argument, is the one who breaks a chair, grabs up the leg and starts to whack people round the head with it. Okay? And for, night, uh, for conversational purposes, let's say they, but that's when they've been drinking. So neither of them can really hold their drink. Dinotrophenol is the one which hits you. Lidite is the one which breaks a chair, a chair grabs a leg and uses that, a leg of the chair and uses that. I, neither exactly ones you want to be dealing with. They're not nice people to have in a bar. They're the sort of people who are going to blow up at anything and usually you hope they're surrounded by big people who know them who can go, put down the chair leg or stop. Just because he smiled in the direct general direction of the, the the person you are with does not mean you need to go hit him. Please and don't go hitting people. That's not a good thing. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, neither exactly stable, nice people to be friends with. But one is slightly less insane. This is the mixture. And getting the ratio right takes a while. Uh, they try a 50-50 mixture first. That gives intermission fragmentation. I, It doesn't make the shell break up enough to allow enough of the gas out quickly enough to do enough of explosive damage. 60-40 was satisfactory. You notice that they're airing on... Because they're doing it quickly, they're airing on the side of the more stable. So 60-40 is satisfactory. So they've literally tried 50-50. Then the next test is 55-45. The next test after that is 60-40. You can guarantee it. Third phase of testing. This is one of the reasons why they're able to implement the shells so quickly. They are doing it rough and ready. So the green boy that comes in and is issued in 1918 is the 60-40 mixture. The one that after World War One is what they start going for is 70-30 mixture. They take time to get there. They carry on. They even try 70-20, they try 80-20 mixtures and they find that that is almost as bad and almost as likely to break the chair a chair and get the, grab the leg as um, the one which is 100% Lidite, honestly. It's, it's, it's Basically, it's going to grab the chair leg nine times out of ten. So, here is the development process of the Green Boy, and it's worthwhile thinking about. Oh, thank you, you've gone away. Now, it all revolves around a gentleman called Drea. Frederick Drea. The same person who comes up with the gunnery tables. Also, whilst working within, in concert with a gentleman called Jellico. So, he is basically, we should consider him Jellico's designated hitter for sorting out problems. Of a gunnery scientific nature. Anyway, the Green Boy was in time intended to penetrate to the machinery spaces and either slow the enemy down to reduce maneuverability or get an out and out kill at long range by hitting a magazine. If it managed to hit a magazine, that was great. If it didn't get through to it, no one's too worried. But basically, the idea was you want to cause trouble for long range at your enemy, for your enemy. And the other problem for the Royal Navy, I have to admit, is the previous shells had been not only tested, but also the concept had been pure Toshima, which was still rooted in the concepts of the pre dreadnought fighting, where you took a used long range fire to weaken your enemy then you got back, you got close and you took him out with six inch guns um, that was a sort of small problem you advanced to long range all long range fire gunnery but you really hadn't changed some of your fighting doctrines as well it's always a problem when that happens anyway in 1910 John Jellicoe as third sea lord had attempted to tighten up quality control and British shells. This was something which he'd also previously attempted to do as Director of Naval Ordnance and Torpedoes in 1905-1907, with his then Commander Dreher as his senior assistant. Eventually, Jellicoe got his wish when his first Sea Lord, this of course is in 1907, end of 1917 and during 1918, he appointed the then Captain Frederick Dreher 
who had been his flag captain at several points, as Director of Naval Ordnance, March 1917 to June 1918. And during that tenure, Drea was charged with taking over control and improving the production of shells, because what had been happened was it had been put into the... After Jutland, a committee had been formed, and as we can all guess, whilst the committee was trying its honest best, it was a committee, and so was having a lot of trouble actually getting through anything. And trying to come up with a way of saying we need to change this without blaming anyone. So, Drea comes along, and Drea's rate of progress was very quick. He decided the caps were too soft sent on the shells, tending to uh, get torn off during oblique impacts. The shell bodies were not strong enough, often breaking up, which prevented or reduced the effectiveness of the filling inside. Both these factors compounded the lidite issues, which we've already talked about quite extensively, and on top of this, the fuses were unreliable. So, he's appointed in March 1917. By May 1917, orders for trial shells had gone out. By September, the new mixture of lidite and denitrophenol was being introduced into the shell filling factories. And a new standard for testing had been set. For a 15-inch shell, it was a 10-inch plate angled at 20 degrees. For a 12-inch shell, it was a 6-inch plate angled at 20 degrees. And... This is the same system which had actually defeated 15-inch shells during the projectile committee testing, which had been organised in March 1917. Uh, the committee had found out the existing testing was terrible. Uh, they wanted to improve. They, they just weren't quite sure how to improve it without blaming someone. Drea had no problems. He just told everyone they were basically, in very polite terms, they were all idiots because they hadn't designed a system by him, and so he designed a new system. It's very pragmatic that approach. Uh, mass production started in December 1917. They were due to normal wartime issues, but new shells didn't reach the fleet till April 1918. And when they did reach the fleet, they reached the fleet in very large numbers, thankfully, and were soon outfitted to the whole fleet. So, if you take that as a timeline, I could, arguably, take it from March to... Well, March 1918 to May... Ni uh, March 1917 to May 1918 is what I could do. That would be a rough estimate, and that would be right. And that would be roughly 9 plus 5, so that would be 14 months. I have added on an extra 4 months to the system, because it seems sensible to be air on the side of caution. So that's where I get my 18 months figure from. Now, 18 months. So, Drea comes in, applies the same methodology as he applied to setting up the Drea fire control tables. And, of course, it's his fire tables combined with, uh, mixed with some technology from Pollen's Argo clock, and, or fire control table, depending on what you would phrase it, which then becomes the basis for the Admiralty fire control table. But there are still, interesting enough, there aren't really any Pollen ones still left in service in World War II. There are still some Drea ones still in service in World War II, along with the Admiralty ones. So, Drea's a smart cookie, and he knows exactly what he's there for. He's very polite about it, and that's probably how he gets away with it in some regards. He's very polite about saying to people, well, it can't be right because I haven't designed it. He somehow gets away with it. He, he's politely calling people idiots to their faces in some regards, but he does get away with it. And he's called in as Jellicoe's designated hitter to do something which Jellicoe had wanted to be, uh, wanted to be fixed as early as 1905. Jellicoe had known there was a problem. This is something which really annoys me in this whole story and whole bit of history. The Royal Navy knew there was a problem the whole way through. They knew there was a problem early on in history. They had no qualms knowing there was a problem. The problem is... Every time he's pushing too close to it, he gets promoted. Admittedly, it's his term to promote it, so you can't be too conspiracy theorist over it. But you can say that the civil service, to an extent, um, especially from the Treasury and the arms companies themselves, have been playing a delaying action, knowing that he has a end point to his tenure. And if you consider it, there's... A while while you get used to being in post and your power, so and your influence and abilities there. So let's say it's about six months while you're learning your role. 
So you have to take the first six months out of any of those appointments. Okay. So he's in post roughly two and a half years. That means he then has two years to push. It's not exactly a long time, is it, to try and turn the mighty beast that is the British maritime defence in industry. Especially when you're dealing with companies the size of Vickers and Armstrong Whitworth, which are colossal, absolutely colossal tankers of industry. And don't like to turn, and don't like to admit they're wrong. And also, they like to keep selling at large volumes. And if they have to admit that their shells aren't good, they're not going to be able to sell as large volumes. And they're going to have to stop selling while they improve them. And you might think, well, surely they can do, uh, surely, you know, they could change the testing and then they could tell everyone the new shells. Well, it doesn't work like that. And it's because then you're admitting the shells you bought are terrible. And that tends to leave buyers with a bad taste in their mouths and go, well, why do we want to buy shells from you for? Because your previous ones don't work. So what you do is every time there's a problem with the shells, oh, we've got a new variant which has improved and deals with that issue. But you don't change the testing because then you'd have to change or omit all the previous shells were terrible. One way allows you to keep selling new shells and make more and more profit. And the other one means you have to omit and damage your own reputation. It takes the combined efforts of Jellico and BT, actually, because he was. This is one of the good, few good things about BT. BT lent his support to this. And. Drea to fix it all. Drea is the point man. Jellico and BT providing the top political cover and stopping him getting in interfered with. Well, it's a shame as people like Fisher, etc., could have dealt with it a lot earlier. And they didn't. They did not. Fisher could. You, you can write a lot about Fisher and various other things. And he had many, many good qualities. But on this one, he was prepared to let it slide as long as they worked with him on the things he cared about. And he thought to Chelsea, oh, that'll still work. They usually... Mat that one go. And that's on him. So the question that I'm, as I've said, that I'm really answering in these videos and really discussing in these videos is, what if proper quality control and trials have been implemented for the Royal Navy shelf recruitment prior to Jutland? Not green boy shells. Because the moment you have it earlier, they might choose to paint them a different colour. The whole name green boy comes about because they're painted green. Because they died a yellow. Well, there is the very real possibility that, you know, if they develop them earlier, they might use something other than dinotrophenol, or they might use dinotrophenol, and they might decide to paint it blue. You have... There, there's... There is always a possibility they paint it bright pink with orange spots. In which case, well, it's many, many years later that, uh, that Mr. Blobby comes to our television screens. But they could be called the Blobby Boys shells or something like that. It, there is... There are options. So that's why I'm using the phrase quality control and trials testing. And talking about Green Boy slash Green Boy esque shells. So then comes the question of where can we start the alternate history? And this is when you get into real trouble. Because if the proviso is it has to be ready by Jutland and they have to be implemented by Jutland, then Dogger Bank is ruled out because that's January 1915 and that's far too close. And this is when we get into real trouble. And this is when I'll probably get the most people going, no, 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 this couldn't happen. Well, in the nicest way, this is the proviso for this to happen. Something of this magnitude would have had to have happened. So then we get the Battle of Heligan Blight, but no German heavy units are present. And even if they were damaged, you wouldn't be able to get a look at them. And you wouldn't probably learn. Because, let's be honest, after the Battle of Dogger Bank, when the Blucher does this, we don't learn. Because the Blucher does this and we won. The Battle of the Falkland Islands. Again, no German capital ships present. 
no ability to examine the hulls, no learning. Pursuit of Gerben and Breslau. Well, that requires one change of order, of one order, for British cab warships to be present. And then you need to have a scenario come up where you get a German, get to look at it. That's not impossible. There are events in history where that has happened. So that's not completely out of the worm. Uh, the, that is not completely out of scenario. That's not completely off the route of march or possibility. So we'll think about that. Admittedly, the scenario where it happens that most people would immediately think about is the Grass Bay in World War II. But it's happened prior to that. Not German ships, but other Navy ships have seeken safety and security in neutral ports when damaged. Both Greece and Italy are neutral. Technically, more likely they'd go Greece than Italy because their route to Turkey is going to take them past Greece and they far more than it's going to take them past to Italy. And especially likely engagement area. So we'll think about that one. We'll talk about it more, perhaps, in depth. The peacetime options. As third sea lord and as part of the Orion class, 13.5-inch gun shell program, Jellico managed to get proper trials and quality control implemented with the support of Fisher and other key personalities. Considering the sheer amount of effort put into fire control and development of long-range fire control systems and fire control tables that goes into and is tacked onto the Orion project, uh, Orion class upgrade, this is not without some precedence to draw upon. But there is a big difference there. In the Orion class, you have a scenario. You have an advantage because no one has any skin in the game on the fire control systems. They're, they develop their new things. So they're new things we can take advantage of to earn money, and so we're supposed to get involved in them, rather than... And trust me, the sheer amount of effort that's put into barking, uh, trying to push the pollen system by the companies, because it's the commercial outside the Navy system, whereas the Drea system is the internal system. And as I said, the Dreyer system survives a lot longer than the Pollen system. Be suspicious. Um, it's interesting, but there is money behind that. For them to get the gun the shells to be looked at as well, you have to get Armstrong, Whitworth, and Vickers to admit there are problems. You need some kind of event, some kind of Royal Navy own organized testing to actually manage to take place under realistic conditions where they can test the way the shells are done and do it to a proper status. So you've got to get someone like Treya in charge of it. Who's a captain at this point, wandering around, sort of. Senior commander captain while he's third sea lord, so theoretically could be put in charge of testing. You need someone like that. Um, but the trouble is he's so involved in the setting up of the long-range fire control, you'd probably have to try and get the testing included as part of that. You'd have to get it to show that the shells were absolutely terrible. And not just a bad batch of shells have been sent to the testing. And the trouble is, as a rule, whenever there was an exercise or testing like that, the shells somehow come special. And we, we can actually find and prove that they do so. That they take special effort with them. So, that could be a problem. However, the Goban and Brezov scenario, well, that, that involves Indomitable and Indefactible, actually it's height, fighting Gro Goban, but not sinking her. And she would ideally be, ideally be run ashore on a Greek island, or take refuge in a Greek harbour and not be destroyed. This would allow for it to be closely examined. As the damage done... With such evidence coming back, Jellico as Grand Fleet Commander would actually be able to push, probably with the support of Beatty and Milne, because remember, Milne would be involved in this scenario because he would be in his battle cruisers would be involved in the fighting 
of um, the Goban and Breslau for the improvement to shell production and construction. Information will be gathered by September 1914, which would give 21 months for implementation, which is why under that scenario and even the Orion class permutation, you have the full fleet would have the ammunition, the new ammunition. Here is the problem. There are going to be people who are going to say, well, Alex, for this to happen, you, you, you have to have these course of events gone on. This is quite far-fetched. Uh, yes and no. I'm looking for a Kazakh ballet to implement it so I have a reasonable scenario for what would why it would come and why alternative history, why it would work out that way. But I would argue this is actually more realistic than this. Because this is going up against the massed political might of Armstrong, Whitworth and Vickers and the sheer number of politicians and business interests and commercial interests they have in their pockets at this time. And my worry is even if you had testing, which did show the problem with shells, they would, oh, it was a bad batch. Or, oh, oh, those are the old shells. We need to get, we've got new shells, which are even better. You know, the old shells, oh, sorry, they're just, they're just finicky. But these are the new shells without actually changing anything. So that's, that, that worries me. I don't think that one works. This one's wartime conditions. And under this scenario, this is when politicians, because this is under the scenario of they still think they can deter war and that war won't really happen. No one really wants a European war. No one really wants to fight the Royal Navy. We're the most powerful Navy in the world. Who wants to want to fight us? What, what, you know, you know, it's fine. The shells aren't as good as they should be, but you know, we'll, we'll improve it over time. And now there'll be no, don't, there's no need to panic or do anything because there's no likelihood for a war. You can hear it now. But in this scenario, we're in a war. The shells are terrible. We've had just looked at a German ship. We've seen the shells are terrible. We've seen what damage they did with hitting it. And what damage, more importantly, they didn't do. We need to reform them. Now, that has power. That has influence. So we're looking for uh, something which would actually cause a change. Not necessarily a the most likely event. And this might be more likely to happen, but I don't think this would even even this would cause a change. Whereas this would slightly less likely to happen, but more likely to actually cause the change. Which I absolutely hate. But if you can actually produce a good solid argument for why in reality, rather than if things worked as they should do and everyone was honourable and out for nationally, out to serve the national interests as best they should in government and politics and out for responsibility, then you can produce this. There are a number who are, but there are always a number who aren't. Whereas under this scenario, everyone gets pushed into doing it because there's a war going on. So everyone is out of the pure national interest. No one can be persuaded So, Goban, Pursuit of Goban Breslau becomes the option. And it's actually also the least changes to history. Uh, the RN already have fire plan, which involve void in firing high explosive or um, common pointed cap shells. Particularly at long ranges, while saving their armor piercing rounds to finish off the enemy at closer range. That's pretty much standard British doctrine. It's the, what we would call the Tsushima doctrine. Um, it's designed to wreck superstructure, cause fires, cause damage to the top of ship, stop it being able to do long range fire, stop it, slow it down, because again, if you damage the funnel, you damage all the superstructure, you stop it being able to con, you take out, hopefully, the people who are able to command the ship. Now... 
this lends itself to a ship which is already running away, because let's be honest, the Goban is going to be running away, because it'll be in a scenario where it'll be against two cruiser, uh, two battle cruisers, five cruisers, about eight to a dozen destroyers. That's that, that's not a good scenario for it. It, it, Go, it and Breslau are going to want to get away. And the thing is, it's going to run into them, and they're going to be as fast as it is. One of them can do 22 and a half knots, which is the same as Goban can. And remember, Goban can do that when it's got best quality coal in it. It's going to have fairly decent Austrian coal, but that's not best quality coal. The British ships do have the best quality coal in them. So that means the one which has the functional top speed of 22 knots and the other one of 22 and a half knots, that might be... Goban's might be supposedly 22 and a half knots, but the odds are... It's gonna. It's probably making twenty-one and a half to twenty-one and three-quarter knots. Odds are, not much for it, but enough that it's not gonna be able to get away. And that means it's gonna get damaged. They might. The British ships might get damaged as well. But again, remember, the Germans are gonna be running away from them, so it's gonna concentrate on flat-out speed. They're gonna be engaging while trying to run after, chase after it. And again. This will have an impact. It's going to have a lot of impacts. It's going to have a huge impact on the whole war. But for starters, there's going to be the Ottoman Empire because, well, A, there's not going to be their holding, but they've got a German battle cruiser. So there's not that threat in the Black Sea. There's also not going to be the scenario that the British and the uh, turn up and try and blast their way through on November the third of November, nineteen fourteen. Because why would they? Because there's no German battle cruiser there. The Ottomans are still getting annoyed that the British have taken their battleships, but there's not going to be that there. There could still end up being a Gallipoli and those sort of scenarios, but it would be after the Ottomans had decided to join the war but without the Germans having had a warning that their forts are particularly weak. And so when the British turn up with fleets and troops probably all organised and push their way through, the, the Darnells is probably not as defended or as organised as, as it was historically. So actually, that might actually succeed. In which case, be very, very scared because Kurt Churchill could get hailed as a strategic genius. Um, I, I, I just want to put that out there as a possible consequence of this scenario. I am trying to include all the relevant history and context that would come from this change of the scenario. But there's also the possibility that it downloads and Gallipoli doesn't happen. Now, firstly, what are the impacts going to be? The idea of firing more shells to increase the chance of actually doing damage with the shells you have is going to catch on more widely. Jellicoe's obsession with accuracy is going to be even more important because it's going to be even more important to get those shells you fire hit the target, but you want to, want to fire as many as you can. So that's probably going to start pushing some things through the fleet. But Jellico won't change, and the, accurate, the desire for accuracy and uh, getting the maximum number of hits to hopefully get those, missile, uh, those shells to work is going to be important. So expect gunnery training and fire control training and rate of fire training to go up across the force. It's even going to affect the battle cruiser force. There's going to be a drive to push their training up earlier than, than Dogger Bank historically did. So expect the Royal Navy to be pushing up because that's a way of compensating for the shells not being as good. If more shells hit their target, then even if uh, if there are an, a number of them don't do what they're supposed to be, you're li more likely to get more of them that do what they're supposed to be to hit their target. Because that's another problem. Because some of those shells which don't hit the target are ones which would have actually worked properly. Because there's a percentage which do work properly. That's the point. They're not. There are some shells which do work as they're supposed to. They're few and far between. But the trouble, if you get more shells to hit, there's more likely that those few and far between shells which do work properly do actually get a chance to do their job. 
Secondly, it'll lead to, of course, development of the improved shells. Green Boy, Green Boy-esque. Uh, namely because Jellico, Beatty and Milne will use it as the wider, uh, and the wider war to push it through, as they did historically. Now, actually, if this happens earlier in the war, there is another advantage because you don't have the army sh screaming out for shells for the Western Front and all sorts of and, and other things at that time. So you'd actually get more efforts devoted towards naval shells. So it might actually happen more, take place. It, 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 let's put it this way. You might not even have the issues you had historically with delivery and things getting caught up because... Other in uh, other stuff is going. The supplies are having to go towards army shells and other things because you wouldn't have that competition. So you actually might get it even quicker than the time period I am suggesting. So you've got twenty one months, and you've actually got probably less problems in delivering it. Thirdly, no Goban, no warning. Del uh, no warning delivered in 1914. As I said, Glyphy Force might even not be there, or no longer, uh, or lo uh, so long, or even required at all. So, eight, or actually, even in the first place, if it does go, might not even require HMS Queen Elizabeth herself. So that would mean an extra 15-inch gun ship would probably be available to battle at British Island. This could mean either Fifth Battle Squadron has a fifth ship of it. Not without the uh, out of the realms of possibility, or although when I did walked it through in the live, I did put her with as um, Jellico's flagship, and the reason I did that as Jellico gave her to Jellico as her flagship was because that was the easiest place for me to put her to have a space to work out what her shells could do, without changing the whole of Jutland because I was trying to be go through the whole of Jutland as if the the Germans still fought it. I don't think they would, as said. My scenario and my personal view is they lose three battle cruisers early on in the, in the run, sort of the, the change of it from the run south to the run north, and a high seas fleet just goes, we're getting out of here. Because they don't want to lose ships. That's the the whole German thing is they want the British to lose ships. They don't want to lose ships. Blow that the British numbers go down and their numbers get closer, so they reach as near enough parity as they can to give them the best chance to win a battle. There, that's the point. The Germans are coming out to try and give themselves a chance to win a battle, not to fight a big battle. They want to find a small enough part of the Royal Navy that they can wipe out with minimal casualties, preferably none, and so therefore the Royal Navy is closer to being on parity with them. That's what they want to do. Their dream is to ambush the Battlecruiser Force. Not to ambush the Battlecruiser Force and find 5th Battle Squadron going, Hello! We're the largest and most powerful guns in the Royal Navy with the best fire control, the best gunnery crews, and everyone's trained tip-top because these are the elite ships in the Royal Navy because we know they're the elite ships. And so we're all here to say hello. That is the worst nightmare for the Germans. It continues on because the Germans are going, hang on, we're not getting, we're getting hit, but we're not getting sunk. Carry on. We can do this. They don't know why they're not getting sunk. But they know they're not. If they had started losing ships, they'd have gone, hang on, those 15-inch guns, no, we've got nothing that can take that, we're going. We've got one ship maybe that can sign the chance, the Barden. But, No. And even the Barden's 15-inch guns, the British look at it and uh, after the war and they look at them and evaluate them versus the British, the Queen Elizabeth guns. And the British say it's a good gun. But it's not, in their view, as good as the 15-inch with the Green Boys of the British one, the 15-inch 42. And you sit there and go, well, let's be honest, there's a bit of pride there, so it's probably about even in guns, but there's then it's one ship versus four, maybe five Queen Elizabeths. It's not that good. But no, it's it, 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 to believe that Barden alone could take on the entire Fifth Battle Squadron and knock it out and survive, that, that that's that's wish fulfillment, not actual reality. So, the affected ships on the order of battle, 15-inch gunships, there are six to seven of them, depending on whether Queen Elizabeth turns up, so that's the two Revenges and the four Queen Elizabeths. 
Then there is HMS Canada, who has 14-inch guns. Then there's the 13 half inch gun ships, um, the King George V's, the Iron Dukes, the Orions, Erin, Tiger, Queen Mary, and the two Lions. And then there's the 12 inch gun ships. There are 15 of those Colossus, St. Vincent, Bellafron, Argincourt, Neptune, Indefatigable, Invincible. Now, as I've said, my view is that if you are really trying to say, okay, yeah, no, or, 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 that it's going to be the lowest potential of shell production, that they are not going to implement as fast as they did originally and historically, that they are going to just do it eh, as low as they can. The ships which are going to get it first are going to be the Battle Cruiser Fleet and the 15th Battle Squadron, which are the 15-inch gun ships. The Revengers will get it as well. Um... They also have the lowest stock of the original type shells, so that's the least investment. HMS Canada, 14 inch gunship, is going to get it. And if it's probably going to be the 13 and a half inch ships, they're going to work their way down, and then the 12 inch gunships. So that will be the order of getting the new shells, again, as they did historically. Battle cruisers first along with 5th Battle Squadron. They get theirs as quickly as they can do, and then you work your way down the gun sizes. Canada and the 13 and a half inches get it at pretty much the same time. Here are some notes from history. 12 inch shells reportedly pass straight through ships without going off. That's great fun. That's even more problematic. 13 and a half inch and 15 shells tended to explode prematurely or disintegrate. Yeah. Brilliant fun. Um, this affected all the 37 ships there historically. It therefore impacts all 38 potentially that could be there and probably would be there. And I could have been really naughty. I'm doing, going to add this that I could have added in HMAS Australia as well. Because, you know, things will change around. If you don't have the ships going off to. If you don't have the ships going off. To Gallipoli. Well, that's going to affect where the Queen of Class are, and that's going to affect the movement of other capital ships. And the odds are, if you have a scenario whereby the battle cruisers are necessary and deal with Goban, you might well have sent battle cruisers down to, or at least HMS Defence, to join with Craddock, which might have changed the Battle of Coronel, which could have then deployed a change either the deployment of the two battle cruisers down there might not have needed to go, which means they wouldn't have been worn. Uh, they wouldn't. Their patterns of use would have changed. The needs of refits would change, and so you, there are endless butterflies. But I am just limiting to the extra Queen Elizabeth class, HMS Queen Elizabeth herself, which seems appropriate. She could have fun here. Now. As I've said, I'm fairly certain it's the battle cruiser runs which are the whole battle. I don't think the scenarios that happened historically would have actually happened. In the battle cruiser runs, the British are peppering the Germans. Yes, the Germans are scoring hits, but the British scored just as many hits. Honestly, in terms of accuracy, the the British have quality control issues in terms of their shells going up, but they don't have quality controls in terms of aiming their shells. And yes, the battle cruisers are not as accurate as the rest of the Grand Fleet. But they do make up for that with volume of fire. So they get roughly as many hits as their German counterparts for firing a lot more shells. I do will say that. So their percentage hit score is definitely not as good. But again, those shells aren't causing the damage they should do. And if they were causing the damage, that's going to change things. Now, one of the interesting scenarios is people usually bring up this point and go, well, what about Dogger Bank with the damage they caused there? They do cause damage there. Which shows that shells can still cause damage even when they don't work properly. They do cause damage. And that's Luca, of course. But other ships as well get damaged. And as we see, 
Sadlitz is almost sunk, the Flinger is almost sunk, and Lutzau is sunk by the damage from these shells. So even shells which aren't as pro working as well as we would like them to, aren't providing, the, aren't the quality controlled, aren't the trial was properly, still cause a tremendous amount of damage. This is not a complete Italian shell in World War II issue. But that's more quality control making the accuracy absolutely atrocious because the balance is off in the shells. Look, if you're firing a shell which is supposed to be accurate and sort of spin in a certain way, a certain way and it's, the balance has got to be right. If the balance is wrong, then the spinning doesn't work, pro uh, doesn't go right. And instead of it keeping its aimed at the target, it starts spiraling off in one direction or the other, and it goes wee wide, or wee high, or low, or whatever, all sorts of places. It's uh, it's amazingly fun. But, this can have other impacts, because let's say the British do cause more damage. Then, honestly, BT might keep on further. He might not realize the grand, uh, the high sea fleet is there till later. He might, his orders to execute were all terrible anyway. So there are issues which can still come. They could still be a terrible day for the British, because BT could run the uh, battle cruiser force straight into the high seas fleet, even closer than he does historically. So he could still lose. Battle cruisers and more battle cruisers. I, he loses uh, loses two. I would work out if he acts as he did originally, and turns when he does. But if he's causing more damage, he might think he can get away with it, and he thinks fifth battle squadrons coming along behind him, and they are. Even though Evan Thomas is very much not of the suicidal bent, and very invites his, his captains that he's not of that scenario. The captains in the 5th Battle Squadron are well trained, well drilled, and let's be honest, Malaya turns herself and just goes, I am NOT going through that cauldron of fire! I have no intention of being a sitting duck and turning in turn, and turning in turn. Um, and then divides up his fire with two firing one direction at the battle cru at the German battle cruisers and two, for two ships covering the high seas fleet. Yeah, Warspite and Malaya taking on the entire high seas fleet. we just a pair of them fighting the rear guard action for the battle cruisers. They're getting away. So that is the scenario you could be dealing with. Although you could also be dealing with a scenario where it's with Queen Elizabeth there as well. So in my scenario, I doubt Windy Corner happens. I doubt these later parts of the battle happen. I doubt Jellico gets to cross the T. But if he does, the amount of damage inflicted is going to be far, far worse. In the run north, the McGrath, one of Hipper's better Dreadnought battleships, amongst a fairly good group of them, gets hit badly by three shells. Two of which go off on the ar above the armour, and one of which actually penetrates but doesn't go off properly inside. And that buckles the deck plating and causes all sorts of damage to her. Imagine if those three shells had all performed properly. Three 15-inch shells had all hit her and performed properly. One not one going a bit of a damp squid does enough damage. Three, that ship's crippled. And that's the real problem for the Germans. Because let's say she's not sunk. Best case scenario for the Germans actually is her being sunk. That's a scary thing to say, but it's true. The best case scenario for the Germans is the battleship being sunk. Because if it's not sunk, they either have to sink it themselves like they do with Lutzau. Historically. Or they have to try and escort it back. In which case you've got a Kate, Mata a Kate Matapan scenario possibly going to happen in daylight. Well, the Germans are limited to whatever the top speed is of that battleship. And people go, always pointing out, going, well, they have the pre trials with them. That limits their top speed. It does. But that's not half as limiting as a damaged Renault would be. A damaged Renault, you want to get home. You very much want to get home to safety. Damaged Renault, you care about greatly. You, you've got a lot of crew aboard her. That's a very valuable asset. 
losing it. You're nurse mating at home. You might be going 10, 11 knots. Imagine what Jellico would do that. The man who managed to cross the T twice of the German fleet with barely any information from BT knows that the Germans are proceeding home wrapped around their battleship which can only go at 10 or 11 knots? Let's be honest, what did the Germans do? Do they divide their fleet off and try and keep them provide a fighting cover to draw the British away from the battleship, in which case they have to go away from home and safety? Or do they form a circle to protect it? And who knows what the British do, because if the British, if there's a battleship going off solo, limping home at 10, 11 knots, the British are going to send something to go and engage that. That's going to be prime meat for battle cruisers or something else to go after. Fifth Battle Squadron, one of them might go off and go, Hello, we hear you need some further attention. So the Germans can't afford to ban it, so which means that ultimately their only solution is either to detach a heavy escort force of battle other battleships with it while the rest of the battle fleet goes on, which is dividing their forces off. Which is the worst case scenario because that allows the British to do to the, uh, to the Germans what the Germans are hoping to be do, do to the British, which is defeat a portion of their fleet in detail, annihilate it, and then they've got a far better odds on them, or the Germans have to escort that ship home, or they sink it. So please note, the best option for the Germans is not damaged ships, it's sunk ships under this scenario. It is sunk ships. They carry on to Windy Corner, they carry on to Crossing the T, it's very likely the coining has also gone. And those are just the five ships which are historically worst damaged. There are dozens of other ships which get glancing blows and damages which are damaged enough that they require extensive work when they get back to the yard. They get back to shipyards, but don't really affect their operations. But you have the shells function properly. Enough of the shells function properly you get a very different scenario. You have enough of shells function properly, the Germans are in real trouble with Jutland. And the scenario goes from being, uh, ah, yes, the Germans had a tactical victory because they sank more ships than the British did. Well, no, they had a numerical victory. The tactical victory, let's be honest, crossing the T twice has to go to Jellicoe. But the Germans do actually manage to beat up BT. So it's a tactical draw uh, with uh, counting numeracy versus the crossing the T. But it's a strategic and operational win for the British because the Germans go home. Well, if the Germans lose more ships, and they would lose a lot of ships if they carried on, then the Germans don't even have the sop of the numerical win. They have the, we managed to get one up on BT, to which... Honestly, if you were Admiral King after seeing Beatty later in the war, you probably go, so does my sock have one up on Beatty. Uh, that's really not a win. That's nothing you should be crowing about. The fact that he's managed to win, survive so many times against you and actually win some fights is something you should probably be taking a long, hard look at yourself over. Maybe going off somewhere for a long contemplation and walks alone on the beat on the coast, looking out to sea to mournful music, going, "What happened to my life that Beatty managed to win?" That's me channeling my inner Admiral King and making it mildly politer, a lot politer, massively politer than what he what I probably would have said. But the point is, you are dealing with the largest concentration of firepower the world has ever seen. In 1916. Okay. In fact, there is an arguable debate as to whether there's ever been a larger concentration of firepower. It becomes interesting once you start working out the numbers. But the sheer amount of firepower you're talking about in this battle is tremendous.
So if you give them decent shells, there is going to be a lot more damage done. They, if they, this is based on the accuracy and everything staying the same, but as you saw, I think actually the sinking of Goban, or the, rather the Goban running around and the details of the shells would cause increased fervor when it came to accuracy, increased fervor when it came to rate of fire, which might actually increase the number of hits. Increasing the number of hits and having better shells to do it with. That's not a good scenario for the Germans, but as I said, in reality, I do not see it going on this long. I do not see there being a night action. I don't see the reason for it. Honestly, I think even if the Germans had damaged ships, I think they torpedo them and get, they get the crews off and torpedo them. I do not think they try and save them. I just think they try and get home. And honestly, as said, I, I don't think they stay out. Now, the point of this video and the thing I was asked was, what are the consequences for this long term if this happens? Um, you never get that big battle, probably. In my view, the Germans go home they don't have the fight and you never get that big battle. If the Germans come out again, they might try and come again again, they might build up their Mackesons, they might try and build up their capital ships and go, we have to have the 15 inch ships because they'll put it down to the 15 inch ships. But in that scenario, you end up with the Royal Navy having more 15 inch ships in service. I see perhaps a different route. Because the battle cruisers will still have been sunk, but the battle, sh the fast battle ships will have done the most of the fighting. So the admiral class might well not be battle cruisers; they might be fast battleships, and there is a difference there. There was some very interesting comments on the live video afterwards, which all went into sort of discussing Hood, and going into details of her armor and those sort of things. And I respect the person who made the comments. I do. And I respect their knowledge and their understanding. But ultimately, Hood is a battle cruiser and is built by people who are building her as a battle cruiser. She's not being built as a battleship. British battleships are built differently than other nations, but that doesn't make them necessarily bad, and lots of nations build them very similar to the British style. And you have to also remember that the effect of the trials on shell design and shell structure also had an effect on British armour design and armour testing. Now, British armour design and armour testing had actually been started to be worked on during the Orion program as well. And testing for that had improved. So British Army was already getting a lot better with the Orion class, but gets really starts to jump up with the King George V's, the Queen Elizabeth's, and then the Rs have far better quality armour than the previous generations. Sort of steps up and then boom, steps up again. The thing is, once you have testing on shells, you also get testing on the armor, which improves the armor as well. And so the armor, which was going to go eventually into the admirals, but probably actually the generation which is aimed for the G3s, N3s, and goes into the Nelrods, is a lot better. But again, the admirals are battle cruisers. Even the three subsequent sisters who are being modified after Hood are still battle cruisers. They're being built as battle cruisers. They're not being built as fast battleships. And do you know how I know that? Because the British actually have a concept of a fast battleship. It's what's fed into the Queen Elizabeth design when they were talking about them being 28 knots and all those things, and they were sort of aiming for that sort of area and then something for 25 knots, and so they can have more armor and all these things, and sort of 
not not more armor, but sort of more firepower and other things are added in. That sort of scenario happens, and I've been over that with the Queen Elizabeth class when I just did a whole video about them. The Queen Elizabeth class come about in that sort of scenario because the British do have a fast battleship sort of doctrine. It's heading there, an operational concept for a fast battleship. So if the British wanted to build a fast battleship, they have a precedent state of built it. They're building battle cruisers. Why? Not because of fighting World War One, but because of fighting what they think will be the next war. The next war they think will be a far oceanic war, which will be moved for more maneuver and trade. And therefore, the battle cruiser makes more sense because it is the weapon you use to both protect trade from commerce raiders by hunting down those commerce raiders whilst cruisers and battleships secure the convoys with the commerce protected and it is also the tool used for actually doing the commerce raiding that's what Britain's building hood for that's what they're building the admirals for it's not the war they're fighting it's for the next war it's the typical admiralty why because the admiralty knows what happens after war's over the government likes to stop spending money and if the government wants to stop spending money, that's going to cause a problem. But that's all in the future. That's a change which could have happened, quite likely. The other scenario I think happens is, do the British develop as much emphasis on night fighting? I think they do, but I don't think it's with quite the same passion. But I do think they still go for night fighting, because the reason night fighting really strikes a hold in the Royal Navy is because of its strategic viability for them in when they're looking at a World War II scenario. So yes, it is part of the whole that they got away after Jutland at night fighting, which really makes the, gives the British a bit of a <clears throat> over it. But there are actual professional reasons why they're obsessed with night fighting, and I think they probably get to it themselves anyway. Taranto is a more interesting scenario because there are lots of the scenarios which you sort of go, well, hang on, would the naval treaties have happened the same way? What happens? All these things could be slightly different, especially if there is a different scenario for a fast battleship. Because I think it's going to sound strange again with the battle cruisers and the changing pace of technology. I think that's one of the reasons why the admirals aren't all completed, because they're changing so much. Because they are battle cruisers, and the British are trying to make them really good battle cruisers for what their equivalent battleships would be. If you're building fast battleships, I think you already have that sort of those changes in place. They're already a bit of a the improved Queen Elizabeth. They probably really would be twenty eight knot ships. They would have those fifteen inch guns. They might even have more fifteen eight more than eight fifteen inch guns. They might have ten. Or they might even have triple turrets. Or they might have bigger guns. It's it's a, all sort of options that you could do. I think they get finished, and I think you can see at least two or three of them. In which case, I don't think you can do a scenario like they do where they just ignore Hood. I think you see a scenario where they have to raise some of the treaty limits. And that's going to have knock-on impacts on everything else. It always does. I want to add this in a bonus. Jutland in the round. I did do this in the live and I'm going to do this again. A Daily Mail reporter in search of news managed to secure an interview at the Admiralty with Captain Reginald Hall, Director of Intelligence Division. Hall, being his usual self, always so polite, always so kind and understanding, responded to the line of questioning posed thusly after telling the intrepid reporter that he was making a fool of himself as the Navy had done very well, because the reporter was going along the lines of, well, this has been terrible calamity, the Royal Navy's lost a huge battle, it's a tremendous, terrible, terrible waste of money and terrible thing. And um, how do you make this out, the said reporter? Well, said the DID, if I kick you out of this room, which I shall do presently, and you get can't get back in again, isn't that a victory for me, even if I get a black eye in the process? Um... Just for you to realise, he did not get a black eye in the process, but he did kick a reporter out of his room. <laughs> Hard. Ah, <sighs> oh. Special soul. 
Further bonus, Jutland. Okay, I have a small pet peeve, and I know I've talked about him a lot myself, and I haven't really included this as often as I should do, but that's because poor Seymour gets the focus, and usually some of the questions are about Seymour. Seymour is not Beatty's only staff officer. In fact, he's his junior flag lieutenant. There is a whole staff with Beatty. Okay. There is a chief petty officer. There are the chief petty officers. There are various sailors, telegraphists, etc. All sorts of people helping him. When the flags go up, there is a petty officer sitting next to Seymour. The flag is not... Uh, Peter Seymour does not pull up the flag himself. There'll be sailors there. There'll be people... There's a whole team there to help him put it together and get it done quickly. There are people there whose job it is to probably prop their officer and go, shouldn't we execute, sir? Shouldn't we drop the flags? There's also the fact there is Captain Rudolf Betnik, who's Beatty's chief of staff, and there he is his other flag lieutenant. Pictured here, Lieutenant Com uh, Commander Reginald Drax. Not lieutenant. Seymour's lieutenant commander. Drax is a full commander. And as a full commander, you would expect him to be helping out his junior. He's also one of the first officers in the Royal Navy who had actually completed the staff course and written a book on naval tactics. So yes, he's going to be very busy. But whereas the Chief of Staff's job is to mainly manage upwards and keep BT focused on task and informed... The job of the senior flag lieutenant is to manage the staff downwards. So he's the one who's responsible for training Seymour. He's the one who's responsible for checking everything's done. Now, what's the point I'm trying to make? Well, Drax is actually a fairly decent officer. And this is another reason why I don't blame Seymour. I blame Beatty. Because when you have a scenario like this, in this case going on, you have to have a lot of people not doing their jobs as you necessarily should do and as you would necessarily think they should do or they would do and as they did do on other ships we have the example of fifth battle squadron right next to the battle cruiser force and how they act we have the whole grand fleet we have how jellico runs the navy the navy is this is not all like this there is a problem in this stuff now either it's bt or it's bentnick Bentic. That is your that is your scenarios because they're the senior people. It's either the head or the neck of the organization. But there is a problem in this staff because these officers are not performing as they should be. Seymour has had plenty of time to be trained in post. He should have been trained in post by him. If he's not got the time to train Seymour, there are big problems going on. And if he's not checked that he's got time to train Seymour and the Seymour is trained, then there is huge problems going on with him. But there's also a Betnik in, a Bentic in between who should also be doing it. Bentic is, supposed, is his chief of staff. The things he drops, he's supposed to be picking up on. And the things Bentic can't do, he does. I do sometimes wonder if in the scenario we've got going on in this in this thing, is if he's not doing the things he's supposed to be doing, Bentic's not doing the things he's supposed to be doing, and Drax is the one trying to pick and run, up and run everything. That has crossed my mind reading it, and because that would explain why he didn't have the time to train Seymour, because he's trying to do everything else. But that could also be me trying to hope that this officer, who does quite well in other scenarios and is very respected in other scenario areas, and works really hard and writes a very good book, that he is not dropping the ball. So, we have the other patron question coming up this week, which is going to be... Uh, the attack on Copenhagen and subsequent operations in Danish waters. The Battle of Yamen is going to be a premiere. It's going to be a recorded video, not a live, because it's Mother's Day on the 19th of March. So I know I've still got a live scheduled for it, but I'm going to take it down. That that's that It's Mother's Day on the 19th of March in the UK. Mothering Sunday. 
and I like my limbs attached, so I will not be doing any broadcasting lives on that day. I won't be doing any Twitch streams. I won't be doing anything. I will be looking at spending the day being nice to my mom because she deserves it. She deserves it every day, but that day she gets special attention. It's kind of like an extra birthday. And we've got coming up this week, we've got Grand Strategy, When the World is Really Not Enough. I think you'll enjoy that one. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and hope this version number four of this video you liked. And yes, if there was someone doing a time and motion study and time productivity study of me, they would probably hate the amount of times I reshoot my videos to get them right. Because I think you're worth it. Even then, I still make mistakes. Like, apparently on one video recently, instead of saying uh, the Swiftra class HMS Splendid, I said HMS Swiftra. <sighs> Falklands War. Sorry. My slip up. Didn't notice when I did a check through the recording. It has let me down. Thank you for watching. Take care. And I don't know if I need to put a question at the end of this video because I'm fairly sure there's enough stuff going around. But the question I've got I would put of you is do you agree with me that if they start losing ships at the beginning of Jutland and it looks like a dogger bank scenario, they don't get that that Sheer goes, I'm getting out of here. I think especially if Hipper's, Hipper's killed and lots out, I, I don't see Sheer hanging on and stay, trying to fight more. But I'd love to hear your views on that one. Take care and thank you for watching.